welcome to another episode of Don't Call It Small. I'm your host, Natasha Foreman. If you don't know me and you have no clue what this podcast is all about, let me share a bit. I'm a lead management consultant at Foreman and Associates LLC, where we provide consulting and professional development services. And Don't Call It Small is where we talk all things business, share tips and news that you can use, and highlight the people and ideas behind the products and services that we buy. To learn more about our team, please visit foremanllc.com. That's F-O-R-E-M-A-N-L-L-C.com. Welcome back to another episode. I'm glad to be here with you today. It's a blessing. Yes, indeed. This is your first time joining us on Don't Call Us Small. We thank you for tuning in and checking us out. Today, we're going to talk about success and the importance of redefining it on your terms. And we're going to even talk about what that means as far as your terms. Let's start off with a quote from Winston Churchill. And it says, the success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. With the overstimulation caused by social media, the news, magazines, so on and so forth, our minds are flooded with images and examples of what society has defined as success, failure, good, bad, ugly, pretty, smart, stupid, evil, heroic, cowardly, hashtag couple goals, hashtag this, hashtag... (laughs) You get, you get my drift, but are the definitions you're learning actually your definitions? Uh, Are those aligned with your views, beliefs, and values? Are you just kind of slapping it on yourself and hoping it sticks and wondering why it's not? You know, one person defines success as the acquisition and accumulation of material possessions. While another person defines success as marriage, family, a home filled with one or more children and possibly some pets like, you know, a guinea pig, a dog, a rabbit. Yet another person may see success as the ability to live a minimalist lifestyle off the grid or as close to it with little or no debt and the freedom to work when and wherever they choose. And someone else views success as achieving their dreams. Some people think that success will lead to happiness. But many other people would agree with Albert Schweitzer that, quote, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. If you love what you're doing, you will be successful, end quote. And some people may have come to realize, just like Henry David Thoreau, that, quote, success usually comes to those who are too busy to be looking for it. Ah, last week, or we we touched briefly in episode 79, but we delve, uh, we were talking about business news and events. And there we focused on the great resignation and people considering their why and the work they prefer to do in the environment they most desire. And we touched on the reality that some companies want to appear diverse, equitable, inclusive, and just when they really aren't. And I think that People are struggling with the concepts of balance, happiness, and success, and people are struggling in the comparison trap, and they don't even know it. If you listen to episode 68, marinate in it. Let me know your thoughts. <laughs> you can send me an email at don't call it small biz with a Z at gmail.com, or just you know hit me up on Instagram or Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, any of those methods are fine. But I, I want you guys to think about something. What do we taught growing up? What do our K through 12 schools teach us about success, happiness, and having a balance between the worlds we navigate through? In school, success is highly driven by the grades and GPAs and test scores and awards we receive. And, you know, if you can also land a role and important sounding title in a campus club or in student government, then that's extra gravitas. And we also learn early on that a 2.0 GPA won't get you into a lot of colleges and less than a 2.0, you're probably going to be repeating a grade level or having to go to summer school to make up the failed classes or you're doing something else, right? You're trying to hodgepodge it to make it out. But 
many students are aiming for that 2.75 GPA unless they're they're high achievers. And high achievers know that their dream colleges have competitive entrance requirements and they need that 4.0 plus high standardized test scores and a jam-packed resume of extracurricular activities, leadership roles, and blah, 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 right? And when you really think about it, schools label us and they place us in boxes with in based on our test scores and grades. And those boxes are defined as, you know, college prep, advanced prep, and then there's the vocational technical route. And if you're an athlete or musician, um, you know, and you're not in either of those two tracks, you know, we try to place this, make this judgment call. And, you know, we say something like, well, you know, they can get a scholarship or walk on if they're an athlete or they can go to a two year and transfer. And oftentimes when we're dealing with, you know, someone who's a singer or musician, I don't know what we end up thinking. We think that we try to push them towards various shows, these different, and, and back in the day, we didn't have these TV shows. We didn't have you know, America's Got Talent and, and American Idol and blah, blah, blah. So you just wished upon a star that somehow, some way you could be seen, heard and, you know, brought aboard because you did not follow the collegiate route. But when we think about the athletes and we think about the way in which they can use their athletic prowess to lead to their social and financial success. We, we never talk about what happens if they get injured and, and what happens when they get injured is this, the, here it is. It's well, sucks for them, right? That's basically after we go through the initial, Oh, wow. You know, People then have the mindset of, wow, it sucks for them. And that person, if not properly molded and if not self-managed, could become the washed up, discarded, has been that used to be popular. If they have not formed a strong understanding of what success is and what failing and failure or not reaching your goal, what it truly means and what it doesn't mean. It's like, and I'm sure some of you, uh, I'm going to share this scenario and I'm sure so many of you have heard it. You've probably even said it. Shame on you. Uh, the, the nightmare of coming home each day wearing fry grease on a uniform is what adults taunt and terrorize young people with. Thinking that a job at a restaurant or as a janitor, oh goodness, that is supposed to be the worst outcome for, you know, a young person, an adult, right? I mean, you could do it in in high school, but as an adult, that's just, oh no, 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 no. Why is that a sign of failing and failure? Because society says so. Hmm. Working hard, providing products and services legally is deemed an unfavorable act because of the industry or sector it's being performed within. Interesting. But the largest cleaning services market in the world is in North America and mostly here in the U.S. of A. with multi-million dollar janitorial companies experiencing substantial growth, even now with through this pandemic, specializing in floor, carpet and upholstery cleaning, construction and post-construction cleaning, residential and commercial cleaning services, and so much more. According to a 2021 post written by L.C. Boskamp, in the U.S. alone, the cleaning and janitorial markets worth an estimated $64 billion, employing more than 2 million people across the U.S. Between cleaning franchises, small businesses, and corporate cleaning giants, the industry generates substantial revenue and grows at an unprecedented rate. So I want, I want you guys to, to, to take this visual with me. We're going to take a quick look at the top 10 janitorial companies in the U.S., Starting first with ABM Industries out of New York, 6.4 billion annual revenue, 140,000 employees. They've been leading in the market since 1909, a hundred plus year history, 
They've grown from a single person window washing service to a corporate cleaning giant, servicing more than 4 billion square feet of buildings each day. They're publicly traded. They have more than 350 offices across North America, Central America, North Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. Serves more than half of the world's most profitable Fortune 500 companies. Mm. Number two on the list, Pritchard Industries, also out of New York. One billion annual revenue, 10,000 plus employees, started in 1914. They've, take, they've taken care of 400 million square feet in businesses across the U.S. alone. One of the largest janitorial businesses in the country, providing indoor commercial cleaning services in more than 25 states. Number three on the list, planned comp, um, companies out of New Jersey. 634 annual revenue, that's in million, <laughs> by the way, not $634. 5,000 employees, offices on the East and West Coast, top-notch janitorial maintenance, security, and concierge services for corporate and residential clients, spread all over Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Southeast, and they're also in the San Francisco Bay Area of California. Been in business over 100 years. One of the largest providers of janitorial services in the U.S. Their portfolio comprises more than 1,000 residential, corporate, commercial, and retail properties across the country. Number four, Service Master. Out of Memphis, Tennessee, 300 million revenue, a little over 1,000 employees. Been in business over 65 years, more than 8,000 license agreements, franchises, and company-owned locations. They care for more than 75,000 homes and businesses each day. <laughs> number five. Number five on the list. FBG Service out of Omaha, Nebraska. 245 million annual revenue, 1,200 employees. Started in the mid-1950s by Wayne Simmons. They've served customers in healthcare, commercial, industrial, utility and education industries. Not only are they one of the largest janitorial firms in the country, they're also ranked as one of the top employee-owned companies in the U.S. Number six, AS Total Cleaning out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 93 million annual revenue, 500 employees, one of the most profitable commercial cleaning businesses in the country. They clean airports, construction sites, daycare centers, schools, hotels, laboratories, Manufacturing plants, medical centers, shopping centers, office buildings, and warehouses. Mm -hmm. Number seven, Janney King out of Addison, Texas. 58 million revenue, 200 employees. They have 120 support offices around the world in over 14 countries, providing cleaning solutions through a network of over 9,000 franchisees. After more than 50 years in commercial janitorial industry, they serve over 60,000 customers globally. Number eight, Coverall Health-Based Cleaning System out of Deerfield Beach, Florida. 49.2 million annual revenue, 342 employees, more than 8,000 independent franchise owners in 90 markets across North America. Yeah. Goodness gracious, 50,000 customers. They specialize in cleaning commercial facilities, including schools, fitness centers, industrial spaces, medical facilities, offices, and retail locations. Number nine, bonus building care out of Indianola, Oklahoma, 49 million annual revenue, 253 employees, 180 independently owned franchises. Number 10, well, that's independently operated. Um, number 10, Allied Facility Care out of Dallas, Texas, 28 million annual revenue, 150 employees. And yet, we scrunch our noses up at janitors. ABM started out as a single person window washing service. Today, they have over 140,000 employees and generate more than 6.4 billion in annual revenue. And ironically, how many folks who used to turn their noses up at janitors are now working for these or other janitorial companies? And, and, and let's be clear, can they not achieve success with or through these companies in these roles? Why, yes. Yes, they can. Once again, by redefining success, we must stop this perpetuation of these stigmas associated with 
certain job sectors and industries and stop trying to dictate what has greater importance and value and telling our children to only pursue the past that will or could lead to those roles, jobs, companies that we have defined as important and valuable. I mean, goodness, why do we keep belittling and minimizing the very roles that make this world go round? I don't know, but we do it. We've all done it one way, shape or form. It's not a position, sector, industry, or company that breeds success. It's the energy that a person generates with consistent repetition over time, getting back up each time they fall and seeing steadier steps time and time again. That, that is what leads to success in whatever way you define success. The success that comes from opening the eyes and minds of students who learn something new and thrive from that learning, that is success. Paying off your car, your home, your credit cards, and enjoying the interest-free life that you now have can be considered success. Sharing your life story through books, articles, speeches, blogs, interviews to help others who may be struggling in, in, in areas that are similar to those that you struggled with, that can be considered success. Living clean and sober day by day, month by month, year by year. Yes, success. Earlier, I mentioned the horror story that was and oftentimes still is embedded in the minds and hearts of young people. That failure is coming home smelling like fry grease. Hmm. Okay. But look at how many franchisees we have owning McDonald's, Burger King, Chick-fil-A's, etc., etc., etc. I want you guys to take a trip with me down memory lane, okay, for a moment, moment. Uh, Ready for this? Okay, close your eyes, close your eyes. We're going to go back. We're going to go back to 1940. Richard and Maurice McDonald, together known as the McDonald Brothers, they went by the nickname Dicks and Mac, respectfully, and uh, and respectively. In 1940, they opened an original McDonald's restaurant in San Bernardino, California. If you're from California, you've been to California, you know it's out there in the, the desert mountain region. This is also the location where they created the speedy service system to produce their meals, which is a method they would become that it would eventually become the standard for fast food. After hiring Ray Kroc as their franchise agent in 1954, they continued to run the company until they were bought out by Kroc in 1961. The McDonald brothers came home every day smelling like the food they served. Folks didn't call them losers. Well, at least not while chowing down on their burgers, right? (laughs) Like, success, how do you define it? We'll talk about the McDonald brothers more in a little bit. Let's keep our minds focused on high school. So we have students and you're voted or assumed to be the most likely to succeed in life. And those students that are put in that box are usually the ones that we define as smart intelligent you know they may also be outgoing and they may have strong political power and what i mean by that is they've honed their skills at building relationships understanding formal and informal networks and making the right moves to gain the favorable outcomes that they are pursuing and you and with that for the most part unless we drop out we work our way through 12 plus years of school And then we either tread through two plus more years in college or we sign up for military service or we go get a job or we take a stab at starting our own business or when we're absolutely not sure what in the world we're going to do because we didn't expect these 12 years to end so fast. We leech off of our parents for as long as possible before they snap us to attention and give us an ultimatum. Get off my couch, get off out of this room, get out of this house, get a job, (laughs) whatever, right? And go take a shower, for goodness sake. Uh, <laughs> but when you're from an, an affluent family, this can be called taking a gap year. And for some odd reason, it usually entails traveling somewhere, like backpacking across Europe. And I guess, I don't know why, I guess backpacking across the U.S. isn't seen as sexy or adventurous or whatever. I guess maybe it's seen as slumming it. I don't know. Anyway. And then there's this expectation that after the year, you figured it out and decided to rush towards a college campus or roll up your sleeves and land a job, most likely using your family's connections to open doors that are closed to most people in society. But what happens to the majority of people who don't have that ecosystem to fall back on and defer to in their time of need? What happens to them? 
Well, they're left with the option of getting a job, going to the military, or going to a two-year or four-year college. And I think that another hurdle to understanding and defining success on our terms is our struggle with the concept of failing and failure. There's a quote from Thomas J. Watson that says, Would you like me to give you a formula for success? It's quite simple, really. Double your rate of failure. You are thinking of failure as the enemy of success, but it isn't at all. You can be discouraged by failure or you can learn from it. So go ahead and make mistakes. Make all you can. Because remember, that's where you will find success. There can be some success after couch surfing for a year or two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had a friend in high school who only applied to the University of Southern California. And that was the only school they applied to. It was their dream school. They were a high achiever at our school, but obviously not high enough to get into USC. And for my friend, they saw this as a failure when they looked in the mirror. Their only options were... After receiving the rejection letter from USC, they could attend a two-year college and then try to reapply or because they had really awesome grades and a high GPA and resume, they could possibly still have a window of opportunity to get into another California university. And then they could try to transfer to USC after two years if that was still what they desired. But because they carried so much shame from this perceived failure, they chose a college as far away from our Southern California city as they could get. And, you know, it was kind of said it was to avoid the possibility of running into someone they knew from high school, I I suppose. And my heart went out to them because here's the thing. My friend had defined success as getting into USC, graduating from USC, and as though success could only come through that path. They did not consider that they wouldn't get in and they saw anything other than getting in as a failure. They didn't consider how many other students around the globe who are also trying to get in and that there are only so many spots available before the windows, doors and vents are closed. Right? So they were blind by what getting into this prestigious school would represent to them, for them, and by others. And I want to say as this example that we must do better for our children. We really must. I, uh, when I was in high school, I applied to schools that had great programs or what I hoped were great programs in my major. And my major at the time was broadcast journalism. And I applied in states that I thought had favorable weather because I had no interest at all. I did not even want to consider being in snow. Did not want it. Wasn't going to embrace it. And in addition to that, I wanted to make sure I went to schools that were in cities in states where people were forward thinking enough that I wouldn't have to struggle with the backwards thinking, make America the 1850s again kind of mindset. And I was accepted to most of the schools that I applied to. I had my top three, top five schools I was interested in. And I was less hung up on the college and more focused on what I was going to do after college. Maybe that's why, I, I mean, I just, I really wasn't hung up on the colleges. Yeah. So anyway, um, I I guess because I was so busy thinking about, you know, my life at age 20 and age 30 kind of thing. I wrapped, I, I, I approached it differently. So, and let me help you with this. I wanted to be a broadcast journalist and I wanted the lights, camera, action, bringing the news to TV screens all over. It's not that my way was right or better. It's just another example of how we pursue what we define as success. But did I just say success? <laughs> but, but, you know, seriously. But when you look at what happened to me, because that seems like, well, how did, what in the world? Because she's not a broadcast journalist. No, I'm not. I have this podcast, but I'm not a broadcast journalist. 
what happened? What happened to me? <laughs> that, that sounds funny. Um, let me let me break this down. When I chose my school and I told all of the other schools that accepted me, thank you, but no thank you. Two months before I was supposed to pack my purple dorm sheets that my great grandmother got me as a gift and all of my supplies that I had and all of my stuff to head to Atlanta, Georgia and, and attend my chosen university, they contacted me with an oopsie daisy and informed me there was no financial aid and housing for me. Not in anymore. They ran out. I'm like, how did you run out? And I, I just, I didn't even go round and round with it. Uh, so I was stuck in California and guess what? I didn't apply to any California schools because I was so busy trying to get out of the state. I was trying to flee. I was trying to run away and start new elsewhere. So here I was stuck and ticked off and declared I would never, ever, ever step foot in sucky old Georgia ever, ever, ever. The interesting thing is this. I never even visited Georgia before applying to school there. Matter of fact, with the exception of uh, one state, I had not visited any of the states where I applied. I, can you see? I was just trying to run away. That's something else. Side note. Um, parents, when you're helping your kids think about the college, the university they want to attend, please take them on these tours. I happened to have gone to a college expo that had been in downtown Los Angeles and representatives from all the, these different colleges and universities came there. But that is not enough. It is not enough, especially back in the day where we didn't have all the virtual capabilities to tour campuses and, you know, they can have all the highlights and you can see this and that and see the city life outside and you can find out demographic. Yeah, we didn't have that back in the day, but okay, I digress. Um, so back to this, my story and the whole success, fail, get up, whatever. So I, I had given Georgia the old, yeah, I'll just, yeah. Anyway, I attended, <laughs> attended the two, the two year college that I had been taking courses at while I was in high school. And, um, I busted my butt working and I had side gigs all while holding down 18 plus units per semester and still finding time to party and club with my friends Thursday through Sunday because yes, I was going to party and club and 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 still make it to my uh, 8, 9 o'clock a.m. class on Mondays. I learned better once I got to my junior year. Anyway, <laughs> when I considered the universities to transfer to, I happened to choose one in California and guess what? I changed my mind on my major twice, twice, two, three times. I don't know. Uh, and I began redefining what I wanted and how to achieve those things. And yep, I tripped and fell and failed sometime miserably along the way. And I still do to this day, learning lessons each time that I do. The goal is not to pick up and carry shame when I'm brushing myself off from a fall. I mean, I didn't drop shame on my way down. So why am I picking it up and carrying it with me? Girl, you better drop that off where you found it. You know, <laughs> that's what I have to remind myself when things don't go my way. They don't go as planned. They don't align with the goals and dreams swirling around in my head or mind map somewhere. I have a tendency like so many other people that all of a sudden, you know, you, you get a little butt hurt, a little, you know, and you pick up that rock of shame. And what you don't realize is as, as you carry it day by day, place to place, it starts to build and grow until it becomes a boulder that squashes you. Like, no, no, because you know, Looking back at my friend from high school, the one I just shared that didn't, you know, that, that that USC had said no to. Now, they, I told you they went to another college, but guess what? They didn't even transfer to USC when they had an opportunity. 
No, instead they thrived at the other university they attended. They earned their degree and then guess what? They've been thriving in their career in a field they didn't even major in. Yes, working in a career aligned with a degree that's not their initial degree. (laughs) Success redefined. And I'm sure they have tripped, stumbled, fallen, and failed countless times. But when I last saw them and when I run across them and I see them on social media, what I see, and I know I shouldn't gauge anything by social media, but what I see when I look in their eyes is a person who has learned to get back up, brush themselves off, start back walking, jogging, all while learning the lesson. And they reimagine, redefine, and refocus. But we aren't teaching our children this in elementary, middle, and high school. Failing is deemed failure like a death, like you're buried deep down in whatever you failed in and everyone's going to walk past your, your failure grave and say, wow, what a failure. I mean, I had a student at one of the universities that I used to work at and that student was determined to get into Harvard for their master's program. They were considered a genius, um, you know, all the scores and and they're registered in Mensa and this and that and whatever. Anyway, they spent their entire childhood and early adulthood glimmering in this genius and standing apart from others because of it. And my student had uh, had had some issues, I'll say, when they didn't get accepted into Harvard, and it was exasperated by the fact that someone close to them had been accepted. And I had numerous phone calls and face-to-face conversations with them after they had received the news and they were devastated. And I was concerned for their health and well-being, especially because I remember how they acted when their world was falling apart, when they had earned a B in a class. And this B for them reflected as failure in their mind. The success to my student was a perfect GPA, perfect academic and extracurricular resume, attending the perfect universities with the ultimate trophy being Harvard. I forgot what that student wanted after Harvard. I can't even recall right now. What I can recall is that in this moment, they were miserable. And I would ask about how they saw their future after the years of academic mountain climbing and everything was tied to this world conquering quest that was never ending because there was always a feeling of needing more, more, more because there was so much lacking in their personal world. I mean, I'll give some clarity without divulging, but this student's family had failed them. And I won't explain how, just trust me, they had. The school system had failed them. Um, And I was determined that I would not join this list of culprits that carelessly wound this energy source up and released it to the world. Uh, So I invested as much of myself in the lessons I learned and what I knew and know and have been learning about failing, failure, success, achievement, and this and that. And thankfully, this student came down off the ledge that they were about to jump from. I mean, not literally, not at that point, but I'm certain that had I and others not intervened and directed this student to get the necessary help to recenter, realign, redefine, that something awful was brewing with a goal of destroying the very essence of this amazing person. It really was that bad, and it hurts my heart to see people struggling in these ways. That's why we see a lot of athletes and creatives, uh, you know, artists, musicians, singers, dancers uh, struggle when their career dreams and goals go kerplunk and fizzle. Success was and is tied to that role for them, that image and anything else only comes as a result of the success in that role. And there's no plan B to being the star football, track, basketball, hockey or whatever athlete. There's no plan B to not getting into the D1 or D2 school, not getting the full ride scholarship. There's no plan B to not being a draft pick, not getting endorsement deals and signing bonuses and that house for your mom and grandma and the neighborhood celebrating you because your success is like their success. There's no plan B to not being a superstar singer, hip hop artist, guitarist, drummer, or whatever. It's... And then I'm going to say this as lovingly as possible to family members family members please 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 you need to stop being the driving force behind that child and young adult's pursuit of dreams goals and success 
if you're living vicariously through this talented person, you are being selfish. You're shaping their view of success based on your own. If your son, daughter, nephew, niece, grandchild is carrying around the added stress of your expectations for them to succeed and somehow score big enough to lift you up out of your deficit, your state of lack, your pit of shame, then you are a problem. You're dead weight. You need to go and redefine success on your terms and then go and achieve your own success, fulfilling your own purpose and mission and stop dictating and trying to navigate this young man or woman's path. Get off their back. Let go of their coattail. Oh my goodness. There's that. And and then you don't know how many conversations that I've had over the last 20 years with young people obsessed with being in front of the camera, holding the mic, dribbling or catching the ball who never consider what they will do if those dreams don't come out as they planned, if they don't actually like the life that comes with that career. And there's nothing wrong with dreaming and pursuing those dreams. I've chased down plenty of dreams that people said I wouldn't achieve. But I also took the time to have reality checks and ask myself, all right, girl, are you okay with things not being as peaches and cream on the other side? Are you okay with not winning? Are you okay if things don't pan out? And when I say, heck yeah, let's soar, chica, then I suit up and soar. And if I crash and burn, and then guess what? I just pick up the pieces and try to figure it out. But I took the time to think about that. And when young folks don't pause to consider if their dreams crash and burn before or during their rise, if they're okay with it and what they would do to rebound or just roll with it, I can't help but to think, I sure hope they were built and molded and still. Because success comes after the fall, the repeated fall, the skin, knees, elbows, and face. Success comes after the numerous no's, the demo tapes that became some exec's doorstop. Success comes after the fifth place and sixth place races. Uh, right? Riding the bench game after game, season after season. Success comes after playing chopsticks over and over and over and thinking you can't possibly play it one more time. It's not a microwave or air fryer experience. Nah, babe, this oven is turned to 325 and it's going to take a while. So many young people never consider that weight they have to carry as the star of the celebrity. They don't realize the sacrifices that they must make on and off the court, the field, the mic, the stage. Look at various celebrities over the years who look absolutely bewildered at what their life has evolved to as though they didn't witness the mania present in the lives of other celebrities and realize that if you want to be as popular or more popular than them, then the territory will include paparazzi, friends and family calling paparazzi, friends and family and extended family, like, you know, four cousins removed, reaching out to you to pay bills, invest in this and that, loan them, money that they most likely won't repay gift them money because heck why even pretend like they're gonna pay you back and you have folks mooching leeching and riding your coattail because you made it because you're a success story your success is their success you're the ticket they've been waiting all their life for they no longer have to pretend to be working hard towards a goal because now they can live off of your hard work and goal achievements yay Do you know what young people say when you broach this dilemma with them? They say the same thing that young people say when you tell them not to try meth because of what it will do to them. They say, nah, that won't happen to me. And what happens? You already know. It's a trap. And if you're not prepared, well-planned, and ready to enter that arena for the gladiator battle of battles, then you will fall to the sword. And something else that always trips me out is that they never consider their realignment when the time comes to retire voluntarily or involuntarily. Like, what's you going to do when the ride ends? What's the next dream goal mission? Blown knee? Entered the league before graduating from college? Didn't invest in other opportunities and didn't build a resume and reputation where you could uh, do commentary for one of the sports networks? So do you return to college, try to get a coaching job, reinvent yourself as a fitness professional training people, or do you quickly think of a business to invest in, a franchise you heard can generate great returns? What you gonna do? 
the ones who are money driven also never consider that it's not the ones in front of the camera or on the field or court making the biggest of bucks it's the ones behind the scenes it's the owner and senior leaders of the team the record label it's the writers and producers and composers who get those residual checks in the mail or direct deposited in their bank accounts as christopher wallace aka biggie smalls aka notorious big said mo money mo problems Unless you are properly versed on the realities of your field, industry, career, and role, and all of the complexities and traps that tag along, you can find yourself struggling in a success death spiral. When I worked in the music industry, I used to call, uh, you know, have these sessions and, and tell creatives, operate as though you are a corporation. Consider your overhead expenses. Pay yourself a salary. Establish a benefit program where you're ensuring that you have medical and dental and life benefits create your board of advisors build a strong reliant trusted or reputable and competent team that you can quarterback to success and create the infrastructure the systems and processes that you'll need to build grow and transform over the years doing so with the ability to en endure the storms that will come your way a lot of folks keep forgetting that it's the music business not music, hobby. It's a business. And you better have the skills, knowledge, and full combat gear if you want to succeed on your terms in that arena because it's designed to work you like a dog, chew you up, and spit you out. We can be so blind to a dream that anything other than the ideal outcome is seen as failing and failure. And it hurts to see people shrink and minimize themselves when their dreams didn't come true as they envisioned them they didn't get into that school didn't get that scholarship didn't get that job career and they wallow in shame miserably replaying over and over the crushing blow of not succeeding where they desire to succeed most so you didn't make it as a baseball player you still love the sport don't you how can you thrive in baseball even if you won't be the star or backup player or a player at all on the team can you go into coaching, training, management, be an agent, scout, or work your way up in a ball club where one day you have a top leadership spot behind the scenes calling the shots? I mean, is it possible? Sure it's possible if you're willing to work for it. And let's say you do make it to the big leagues. You succeeded. Are you satisfied with that? Is it more than enough that if by chance... You injure yourself or get a little slower or weaker that you can sit back and say, it, I had a hell of a ride and I loved every bit of it. Next stop is my new chapter, doing something else. Or is your success tied up in this role, this position, this period of time? Is success being the rapper with the groupies and on screen making it rain, smacking booties of oiled up video models, all while you're dancing and gyrating with tons of jewelry on your ears, neck, wrist, fingers. And when you get that, then what? Look at our death rate of creatives in the music industry, the suicides, the death by drugs and alcohol. What we're seeing as a struggle with success and how it is being defined, navigated, and managed. We must redefine success and do so on our terms and not naively or ignorantly. Not the it won't happen to me syndrome that later leads to your meth zombie state. I mean, redefining success by being clear as to what you want, don't want, the boundaries that you will enforce, and what's the deal breakers that threaten your peace. I'm looking around and it's like the music that we hear is everyone's regurgitating everyone else. And it's because it's this follow the follower. <laughs> Not even follow the leader. Just follow the follower. The groupies are there. No matter what industry or sector you enter, the fancier your title, car, and clothes, the more groupies will flock to you like flies on cow patties. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. And, and here's what we, what, what we hear from, you know, like, let's say it's an athlete. All I want to do is play ball. It's my childhood dream. I just want to play ball. 
and that's what you say then bam you're cheesing like the kool-aid man with four females draped across you and you're thinking i'm the man not knowing no fool you're about to be the recipient of some jerry springerish maury povich style you are the father nightmare news and uh then like mosquitoes the rest swarm in and then you're the athlete with five plus child support cases and you're now playing ball to pay child support not playing ball because it brings you joy anymore (laughs) nope you didn't mention that when you were talking about your childhood dream don't recall hearing about that when you look back what you will find is that you made poor choices about your inner circle You did not wisely choose the players for your personal team. You didn't prune your garden and take care of the small weeds before they grew and started taking over. And have you ever noticed that when you fell hard, when you hit rock bottom, those weeds that choked off all of the goodness in your life are nowhere to be found? Well, that's because they had to slither off to find fresher soil to contaminate. They needed to go find an award-winning garden to latch onto because now you're the loser. (laughs) It's, it's amazing how much you end up investing in people that haven't even achieved success by any means, except they succeeded at latching on to you. And you don't see all of these variables if you're constantly chasing more, more, more. So you have to ask yourself, what's the more? And is it just the thrill of the chase or Are you handcuffed to a false reality that the chase is the only way to achieve success rather than seeing that success is your ability to chase? Mm. Think about that one. What lesson did we miss or not receive growing up that leads us to this hazard sign in the road? Let's go back to my high school story. And, uh, you know, not mine in particular, but high school in general. If you went to college immediately or sometime after high school, what were you taught that you're supposed to do during and after college? Well, you know, during college, you're encouraged to get a job or two or three, and you're trying to get internships and consider summer abroad opportunities and work your butt off for as many grant scholarships or whatever else you can get your hands on. And yep, that means you're probably working at a fast food restaurant, janitorial company, clothing store, shoe store, or some other service job. And while attending school and juggling all of your tasks and responsibilities, you're supposed to fine tune your political power to hobnob and connect with as many people of influence to try and land yourself your dream job upon graduating. And maybe while you're doing all of that, you meet the love of your life. Or you just run through a bunch of people who end up being like ghosts in your memory decades later. Okay, there's also middle ground in that. I know those were the two extremes, right? (laughs) but success in college is usually tied to the goal of career outside of college success in college is based on grades and awards and designations and titles and how quickly you can graduate it's rare to run across students who actually understand the importance and value of the relationships they form while at the college it's even rarer to find students who understand that those relationships include their professors advisors and administrators all of whom are gatekeepers and possible sponsors and walking Rolodexes of connections with possible opportunities just waiting to happen. And yes, I know I aged myself by saying Rolodexes. And guess what? I don't care. I've said it so many times on this podcast. (laughs) And most students are oblivious to this because of how we're conditioned to see and experience college. And let's be clear. so, So many of you have you know, you've pledged and you've, become, you've joined various, you know, fraternal organizations. And you're in this sorority and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and maybe you understand the value of that beyond this, the social type of, of experience. Like maybe you've understood the, the depth of how you can use those relationships and those that mentored you through that um, in order to open up doors some of you do and you and you get it and you benefit from it and it has a an amazing return on that investment it amazes me how many of us thought it was the end of the world and a sure sign of our failure that we did not graduate in exactly four years because we were attending a four-year college or university and it's a four-year it's a four-year 
I'm I you know I'm supposed to leave out of here no no more than four years. <laughs> you know, because graduating in four years or less is success for a lot of students. Achieving and maintaining a 4.0 or higher GPA is success for a lot of students. It's like the boxes and labels that we were talking about in episode 78 and briefly last week in 79. We're defined by these boxes and they're difficult to burst out of and break free and reimagine. But you need to, you must, if you want to redefine success, happiness, joy, balance, and anything else on your terms. And that's why when you read about super successful people who dropped out of college or never attended, you got to applaud them because guess what they did? They reimagined, redefined, rerouted, and refused to be boxed in or have someone dictate to them what success is and how they would achieve it. Because for you, success could be getting a job in an industry you dreamed of working in since you were a child. Success could be marrying your high school sweetheart and taking road trips every year with your family. Success could be volunteering every month to your favorite nonprofit, charity, or school, giving to others like someone gave to you. Success could be building or buying your tiny house, overlooking views of the cityscape below, and enjoying the simple pleasures of life. Or success could mean busting your tail through law school and internships and clerking for this judge and that judge and becoming a lawyer yourself, and then years later becoming a judge, a truly honorable one. Not just because of title, but because of your character and doing your part to help provide opportunities. And, and I mean, there could be so much that can come from that second and fifth chances that you can give people who come before you in court or whatever. You can rule on something that's life altering that could have uplift and great impact. Or maybe you define success as being the one or a group of ones who discover a cure for a disease or Maybe you invent a device to assist with mobility or invent something that will aid hospitals and surgeons and specialists. Maybe success is working for the same company that you fell in love with at the age of 25 and retiring from that company at age 65 and investing in this and that while spending quality time with your children and grandchildren at the lake every weekend. The key is not to fall into the comparison trap like we discussed in episode 68. None of the examples that I've shared so far are easy stickers that you can slap on and then mystically, magically, shazam, success appears. As Chris Hadfield is quoted as saying, almost everything worthwhile carries with it some sort of risk, whether it's starting a new business, whether it's leaving home, whether it's getting married or whether it's flying into space. In 1948, the McDonald brothers fully redesigned and rebuilt their restaurant in San Bernardino, California to focus on a reduced menu consisting of nine items. Count them down. They had their 15 cent hamburger, a cheeseburger, soft drinks, coffee, milk, potato chips, and a slice of pie. Not even french fries yet. Just some potato chips. The McDonald Brothers restaurant was a success and with the goal of making $1 million before they turned age 50, the brothers began franchising their system in 1953, beginning with a restaurant in Phoenix, Arizona, operated by Neil Fox. Now, as I mentioned earlier, they drew the attention of Ray Kroc, who was a milkshake mixer salesman for Prince Castle. After they purchased eight of his multi-mixers for their San Bernardino location, Old Ray visited their restaurant in 1954. And the one that's in San Bernardino. And that same year, the brothers hired him as their franchise agent. He took 1.9% of the gross sales and that left the brothers, they got, of that, they got 0.5%. And what you end up hear, reading about and hearing is that he, Croc, became frustrated with the brothers because they wanted to maintain a small number of restaurants. They wanted to be a small enterprise. And Ray wanted to go big or, and go bold. And he wasn't trying to be small potatoes. So in 1961, he bought mcdonald's from the brothers for 2.7 million and it was calculated so as to ensure that each brother received one million dollars after taxes ha 
And at the closing, Croc was even more upset. He was so annoyed because the brothers would not transfer to him the real estate and rights to the original San Bernardino location. And the brothers had told him that they were giving the operation property and all to the founding employees. So he got ticked off and he opened a new McDonald's restaurant near the, their lo, original location. And that original location had been renamed the Big M because the brothers had neglected to retain rights to the name. The Big M closed six years later and it's alleged that as part of the buyout, Croc had promised that, um, and it was a handshake agreement, that he would continue the annual 1% royalty of the original agreement, but there's no evidence of it beyond the claim by a nephew of one of the McDonald brothers. Anyway, neither of the brothers publicly expressed disappointment over the deal. And speaking to someone about the buyout, Richard McDonald had reportedly said that he had no regrets. What was really cool was um, Richard was the first cook behind the grill of a McDonald's ever. So he was the first to come home every day smelling like McDonald's food. On November 30th, 1984, he was served this um, ceremonial 50 billionth McDonald's hamburger by Ed Rincey, then president of McDonald's USA at the Grand Hyatt Hotel in New York City. You know, and it's interesting because a lot of people could and probably would be ticked off. Many more would be a candidate for some of these murder mystery shows that we see on TV nowadays. But the McDonald brothers never publicly expressed disappointment. You, you have to ask yourself, why? It's probably the first, like, why? Well, if you look back at their story, that could give you an answer. What did both brothers want? They wanted to earn $1 million before turning age 50. They wanted to keep a small number of locations. They didn't want a nationwide franchise and you know, in an empire and, and definitely not a global empire. They define success differently than Ray Kroc, differently than many people. They had a handshake deal and their handshake deal earned them both $1 million after taxes. They had achieved that goal and had successfully expanded through their franchises. They turned over ownership of the San Bernardino location, the very first store to the founding employees. Now, granted, the store went belly up six years later, but they did make it an employee-owned business long, long, long before the concept was popular. And what an amazing gift to give those loyal employees. Now, like I said, six years after, everything went belly up with it, with the, the big M, but you get the, the drift, right? So here's a quote. Um, it's I unknown author, uh, unknown person who said it. Success isn't just about what you accomplish in your life. It's about what you inspire others to do. And so when I think about the McDonald brothers and what they inspire people to do, and it's not just in the restaurant business, just in, 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 in food industry, but across sectors and industries globally, like think of how they inspire innovation and creativity and leadership and doing business with honor and ethics but how many people know the backstory the behind the scenes how many people assume that the brothers wanted the empire that we now see and we'd be shocked to know that all they wanted and felt they needed was a fraction of that sure the generations born later could be appalled because there's billions in revenue they can't cash in on but the McDonald brothers weren't dumb, ignorant, or naive. I mean, you could say they were. I mean, you could say, like, how could you forget to keep the, the, the name licensed so that you could continue having McDonald's and you wouldn't have to change it to the big M? Or, dude, how could you not put in writing about the 1% uh, you know, royalty? Hmm. You could say that. But if they were still alive, they would probably say that they had just been, they were satisfied. They achieved their dreams and goals and even exceeded them. They invested 21 years of their life building, fulfilling, living, and being rewarded by their dreams. And they left an imprint in this world and their name would outlive them, leaving behind a strong and honorable legacy. And I want you to think about something. 
how many people haven't even done a fraction of that? How many people will their legacy die when they die? Their name goes with them. What's success? I I want you to check out episode 40 of our podcast where we ask the leadership question, what defines you? And, and here's the thing, even if they had desired um, to invest in or start a new business, because they could have, right, after, after they had, you know, sold McDonald's to Croc, um, they could have seen business as Richard Branson that, you know, quote, business opportunities are like buses. There's always another one coming. They could have, or they could have just sat back and had some fruity drinks with umbrellas in it and sat back on a beach. I mean, let's look at one of McDonald's biggest competitors, Burger King, headquartered in Florida, founded in 1953 as Instaburger King. Right? After visiting the McDonald Brothers original store in San Bernardino, the founders and owners, Keith Kramer and his wife's uncle, Matthew Burns. So Keith and his uncle-in-law they purchased the rights to two pieces of equipment called instant machines they opened their first restaurants their production model was based on one of the machines they had acquired which was an oven called the insta broiler this strategy proved to be so successful that they later required all of their franchises to use the device and then after they had some issues then their you know their company started faltering in 1959, they had money issues, management issues. It was purchased by their Miami, Florida franchisees, James McLemore and David Egerton. Now, McLemore and Egerton initiated corporate restructuring of the chain. They jumped immediately on renaming the company Burger King. They ran the company as an independent entity for eight years, eventually expanding to over 250 locations in the U.S. before they sold it to Pillsbury in 1967 over the next half century the company changed hands four times with its third set of owners which was a partnership and that partnership consisted of tbg capital bank capital and goldman sachs capital partners where they um, they took it public in 2002 then in late 2010 3g capital of brazil acquired a majority stake in the company that was valued at 3.26 billion Then they started restructuring the company. 3G, along with partner Berkshire Hathaway, eventually merged the company with Canadian-based donut chain Tim Hortons. You know Tim Hortons, especially if you're in Canada. And they did this under the auspices of a new Canadian-based parent company named Restaurant Brands International. Now, I want you guys to think about something. Would you call these corporate changeovers acts of success or failure? It depends on how you define success. Did Keith Kramer and his uncle-in-law, Matthew Burns, see themselves as failures when they had no choice but to sell their company to their franchisees, James McLemore and David Egerton, roughly six years after launching? I mean, it depends. They could have said, heck, we've had six strong years. It was a good run. Let's get out while we can and take this cash and go sit our butts down. Or maybe they said, wow. Look at what we've built in this short period of time. We've had some pitfalls and blunders, and now it's time to hand our baby over to someone else to raise and nurture. You can say that Kramer and Burns saw and lived out loud success. Just like eight years after buying the company from Kramer and Burns, McLemore and Egerton sold the company to Pillsbury. But let's look at what they accomplished before selling. I mean, they're credited as the pioneers of the modern day Burger King. You know, they came up with the Burger King mascot in 1955. They invented the iconic Whopper sandwich in 57. And perhaps most important is they improved the Insta Broiler with a gas grill they, that they called um, the Flame Broiler, which remains the centerpiece of Burger King's marketing as the company cooks its burgers over an open flame, unlike most fast food restaurant chains that use flat top griddles. I will say that Carl's Jr. also cooks over an open flame. And honestly, I prefer open flame to flat top any day. 
And before you say anything, to those of you that know I've been a vegetarian for like the past two, three years, no, I haven't been chomping down on the beef burgers. I ate the Impossible Burger at Burger King and the Beyond Burgers at Carl's Jr. And yes, they flame broil them, making them extra, extra yummy. So let the record show. Um, <laughs> let's get back to McLemore and Egerton. Look at what they did uh, with the company formerly known as Instaburger King. Consider how many ideas they tried and blundered along the way, but they kept pressing forward. And look at how disciplined they were during those eight years. They built their reimagined idea, expanding it to 250 locations before selling it to Pillsbury in 67. And I would call that success. And as of December 31st, 2018, they had reported they had over 17,796 outlets in 100 companies. I mean, companies in 100 (laughs) countries. And of these, nearly half are located in the U.S. and 99.7% are privately owned and operated. They have new owners moving to an almost entirely franchise model. That was in 2013. I mean, with the exception of Hungry Jack's in Australia, that's the only franchise that operates under a different name due to that a trademark dispute and legal cases and blah, blah, blah. But all of their other franchisees operate under the name Burger King. I mean, and just like McDonald's, Burger King's had their share of lawsuits. I mean, being about the defendant in the plaintiff seat, they've made mistakes and marketing blunders. They've struggled and failed. They've picked themselves back up over and over again only highlighting a great quote from William Durant. Forget past mistakes, forget failures, forget everything except what you're going to do now and do it. And it's like, that's what I'm talking about. (laughs) That's what I'm talking about. That is how you define success on your terms. That's how you define success on your terms. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, it's time to pivot our conversation and shout out some businesses. If you weren't with me last week, then you don't know that this is our new shout out music. Mm, mm. So let's give a shout out. The first one is to Glow Studio. Glow Studio. S-T-U-D-E-O. That's with an E and not an I product photographer in los angeles california they provide product photography with an art direction they create images that tell a unique visual story to your brand they want to work with you to get your products to stand out so if you're looking for social media and website content to advertise your products contact glow studio they have a background in photography of course and digital marketing brand strategy and web design and they provide still life e-commerce stop motion photography and more They have bookings available for July and August. You have to inquire for a custom quote. So visit their website, glowstudio.com, and you can check them out on Instagram at glowstudio. Shout out number two, Sample House. Diana Adams is the molding hands behind this company. Her Instagram profile says that she's a black potter making dope handmade pottery and home decor in Long Beach, California. She has a partnership with West Elm and she and the company were mentioned in June's issue of Better Homes and Gardens. If you want to know which the cover that is, it has um, Harry Styles is on the cover if you want to check it out. She does amazing work that you have to see for yourself. So visit her website, mysamplehousehaus.com and on Instagram, sample.haus. Shout out number three, the Golden Girl Company. Amanda makes handmade resin housewares and jewelry that you can purchase from her Etsy shop, Amazon Essentials, and more. Visit msha.ke slash the dot golden girl dot co. And she's on Instagram at the.goldengirl.co. I hope that you will check out and support these businesses. Spread the word and tell others. 
and help these business owners achieve their goals and the level of success by whatever way it means that they define and pursue success. Please. <laughs> yes. Well, folks, you know what that music means. It's that time again, time to go our separate ways until next week. But before we do, I wouldn't be me if I didn't leave you with some words of wisdom, inspiration, motivation. So let me share two quotes that hopefully will make you think, reflect, and then do something. The first one is from Thomas Edison, and it says, Many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. The second quote is from Albert Einstein, and he said, Try not to become a man of success, rather become a man of value. Now, we're going to put the modern flip on that and say, Try not to become a person of success. Rather, become a person of value. Now, with that, if you guys have any suggestions for topics or you want to add someone to our business shout out list, you can email us at don't call it small biz with a Z at gmail.com. You can also tag us on social media. You can DM us, whatever. However, you can try to send some smoke signals. I can't guarantee that we'll answer. (laughs) But just know that we are open to um, all the different suggestions that you have. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you guys so much for, for joining us each and every week. I truly appreciate it. With that, be sure to check us out on Facebook at Foreman and Associates and on Instagram and Twitter at Foreman LLC. Our podcast Twitter handle is It Ain't Small and our Instagram is Don't Call It Small. Be sure to also follow us and share us with your friends, colleagues, and family. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Natasha L. Foreman. Reach out to me, say hello, share your story. I look forward to meeting you. I want to make sure that I give proper credit for our show theme song. It's called Higher Up and it's by Shane Ivers. Thank you for tuning in to the Don't Call It Small business podcast, for sharing these episodes with others and for your continued support. And don't forget what I tell you on each and every episode. Don't call what you're planning, thinking, dreaming, or doing little or small. Go big, go bold, or go nowhere. I'll see you here next week. Make today a super awesome day. Take care.